Hi guys, um, this is me, Monica. I've been developing software for 12 years. Um, the last five years I focused on social networking. I worked at MySpace, Facebook, and then Socialcast, which got acquired by VMware. And I'm now working at Cloud Foundry, um, which is owned by VMware. If you have any questions after the talk, there's my contact information. And uh, Paul, do you want to introduce yourself? Yep, so I'm Paul Jones. So I'm both the founder of 23Y, my own company, and a senior developer at LShift, who some people may know were the original developers of RabbitMQ. Um, through those sorts of things, I've worked for big and small companies. I personally try to be a generalist across as many languages as opportunity allows, which thankfully has been quite a few. And I also aim to select the right people for the right job. And my contact details are there as well. I don't work for VMware, so don't ask me questions about that. Thanks, Paul. All right, so today we're going to cover a couple of things. Uh, first of all, why do we need a platform as a service? What is Cloud Foundry? How to deploy and scale apps on Cloud Foundry? How to bind application services? And then finally, a demo of adding Erlang to Cloud Foundry. Um, and Paul is going to lead this part since he was the open source contributor. So let's back up for a minute and talk about the state of software development today and um, the need for increased agility. So 10 years ago, over 10 years ago, when I lived in Ohio and I was studying computer science, I wanted to have a computer in my head. I just really love computers. I didn't want to carry the things. I didn't even have a laptop, actually. So I just really hope um, to have this mobility and applications that could help me leverage all of the the intelligence from my society, right? I wanted to use it for different papers and so on. So, well, we have seen hardware evolve very rapidly and there's Moore's law that says that every two years, our processor speeds are gonna double. That is not true for software development. So software development is still very hard and painful and it's very much a craft. So agility is really a survival skill. There's lots of demand for software products, and there's demands for software products all the way from phone applications to social apps. And not only do you have to deliver very fast, but you also have to iterate and adjust to your audience. So we think that a great solution for this kind of demand is a cloud platform. So a cloud platform enables you to be more agile because you, have to, you don't have to worry about configuring a plethora of systems and your own software stack, and you can just worry about writing the code and pushing your apps. You don't have to worry about updating the operating system, trying out different services, all that is packaged for you. So cloud platforms in general write the unit of currency to be the applications and services instead of the infrastructure. And there are other cloud platforms out there. So there's Google App Engine, there's Joy and Heroku, um, there's Amazon Elastic, and some of them offer a single language and some of them have started expanding. Um, but we really are seeing people infiltrate more and more languages such as Paul. I think, Paul, you told me how many languages? Like, you code in Java, Ruby, PHP, PHP. PHP. yeah. It's, it's incredible. So more and more people want to try, use the right tool for the right job and try different languages. So that's definitely a need. And also, you know, the enterprise, which is the focus of VMware, really wants some parts of their data to be private. So offering this private hybrid cloud is what VMware is looking at doing. So Cloud Foundry, once again, you know, is operated by VMware, is built by VMware. Um, here is the list of languages that are currently supported, and you won't see Erlang there yet, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but this is on cloudfoundry.com. And then there's a variety of web frameworks, Rails, Sinatra, Node.js, Spring Rails, and a variety of services. So how many of you have used MongoDB? Anybody? Okay, great. So why did you use Mongo, if you don't mind me asking? Uh-huh. Uh, so I did not use Mongo for production. Okay, okay. So what we're seeing um, 
from our users on Call Foundry is that Mongo actually has huge traction because people are, when they're experimenting with applications, they like the fact that it's schemaless and they just like the ability to very quickly on each iteration add new properties to the documents. And I'll cover that in a little bit more detail very soon. Um, and then, so basically Cloud Foundry gives you a choice of data services. So we have not only Mongo, but we have Redis, RabbitMQ, MySQL, Postgre. I'm sure you guys are familiar with that. And it's really infrastructure independent. Um, most importantly, it's open source. And um, the source is on github.com, Cloud Foundry, and the project is called VCAP. Um, touching very quickly on the cloudfoundry.com service, this is what you can get today. And if you want to actually leverage the community contributions, here are the instructions for you to set up your own Cloud Foundry service. So basically, what you're going to end up doing is bringing up an Ubuntu image and then just run a script that's gonna configure everything for you. And then you're just gonna target that environment instead of the cloud. So it's the same API, you use the same tools, but you are now targeting your own forked version of the code base. And in this version, we actually have support for airline. And with that, I'm gonna let Paul tell you about how he contributed airline. Okay, so in my part of this, I'm gonna cover the technical details of how Erlang is actually part of Cloud Foundry. So I'm gonna take a few steps to get there. So the first thing is about understanding what Cloud Foundry actually provides to a tenant language, so the services that you get for free simply by integrating with it. The next bit then is gonna be what a language actually has to do in order to fit into Cloud Foundry, what the constraints are, the contracts, and so on. And then finally, I'm gonna get to how Erlang is actually fitting in, so the various trade-offs that had to be made with Erlang, the way that it gets packaged, the constraints that get put on the application. So, Cloud Foundry provides a bunch of application services to every application. That, that regardless of the type of application you're deploying on top of it, you're gonna get these from Cloud Foundry. So I'm gonna work through each of these ones, explain why you want them, and how they happen to be there. So the first one is HTTP routing. So when you've got a couple of applications deployed into your private cloud, then you're gonna need something in front of them to work out, based on an incoming request, which application it is that needs to handle it to serve it. Also, when you've got multiple instances of your application, you need something sitting in front of it that's gonna route that request to one, to the, one of your instances, hopefully on some kind of algorithm that balances it nicely across them. You're also going to want something that ensures that if you bring up a new instance or you deploy a new application, that things get routed to it on demand. You need flexible routing that handles the application changing immediately. Next up, you get application distribution. So when you deploy your application normally, if you've just got one server to put it on, deployment doesn't tend to be a big problem. It's just copy the code on there, use some kind of deployment framework, and it's not a big problem. When you start getting to the point of wanting to deploy your application to multiple hosts, or your, oper your operations team wants to expand it out to another host, that's when things start getting a bit tricky. With Cloud Foundry, as long as your application has an executable entry point, it's been bundled up into a directory of files that it can shuffle around. You essentially get this for free. If your application needs more instances, Cloud Foundry will do that automatically when you give it the right command. If, you, if a host needs to be taken down, then Cloud Foundry will find another place for your application or if your application happens to crash, it'll bring up another instance somewhere else. So all of that is just automatic, you don't even need to worry about it. Next is service binding. So as we pointed out just before, services are things like Redis or Rabbit or Postgres or MySQL. Normally in most systems you find that when you design the deployment, either someone says you just have to write a config file, someone in operations has told you where those, where those resources happen to be, or they say you have to have your config file in a certain place and they'll have some kind of automation that overwrites it. In the case of Cloud Foundry, all you need to be able to do is in your application read out an environment variable and you'll have the details of all the services. Operations can then configure them to be shared between multiple places, they can rebind them, they can add new ones. All that control 
is pushed out of the application config files into somewhere centralized that works across all the different services. So there's one uniform way to manage that. Finally, we've got management. So this is kind of more of an add-on nice to have feature, but it's certainly one that ends up missing from most deployment infrastructure. You can configure in Cloud Foundry which users are actually able to push the applications. So instead of just having it, there's either people can deploy your infrastructure or they can't, and usually in most cases it's they can't. Then you, in here, you can actually instead choose to privilege users, add them at whichever time you like, and you can actually allow new applications to be deployed by any user, you can have isolated cloud, etc. Okay, so moving on from here, it's the question of what do you have to do in order to fit into the platform? What are the constraints put on? So the first one is, is that your, your, your application has to run as a process. Realistically for Erlang, this isn't a big ask. You start an L binary, you put it at the right place, and everything's okay. This one tends to be more of a problem if you've got something like PHP or ASP, or even a Java web app that's deployed as a war. These things tend to need application containers, which makes them a bit more difficult to deploy into an architecture like this. You've got to wrap them up with the container. You have to respond to HTTP requests. So this is kind of following on, again, from the container thing, that your application needs to boot. You need to be able to respond to an HTTP request, and you need to be able to do all the servicing. Usually the best way to test that is your application can be started directly from the command line and respond to HTTP requests, ignoring any need for a backend. Then it's going to work like this. Cloud Foundry will tell you what port to listen on, and then you're good to go from there. Next up, your application needs to die when it's dead. So this is obviously a topic fairly close to Erlang's heart. So I don't find that I'm going to get much pushback here. But if the application fails internally, if it doesn't crash out and die at the, at the OS level, then the Cloud Foundry management system doesn't know that it needs to bring up another one elsewhere or it needs to recover your current one. So if your application starts failing in any way, you've lost a back-end service, or you've run out of memory, then if you just go down, then the platform is there to fix it all up for you. The next one is handle being terminated abruptly. And when I say abruptly, I mean kill minus nine abruptly. So the platform will, a limit, will very brutally kill off applications whenever it's finished with them. So if, if someone says they want to downscale a number of instances, or if the platform decides to move your application to another host, you don't do any kind of gentle shutdown, it's all go away right now. Usually this is because if you're running a larger operation, if you had to wait for every application to shut down gracefully, that could take quite an amount of time. The other thing is also, if a host crashes out, it's not like you're gonna get some kind of gentle shutdown. So if, you, if it always happens the exact same way, then you're always gonna be prepared for the worst. Next up is keeping the binary small. So because your application can be distributed amongst any number of nodes and the system may choose to rebalance you at any point, whether it's a maintenance operator trying to do something or if someone wants to upscale or if a host is being shut down, then you need to, the code is being copied around. So the smaller it is, the faster it can be copied. So to help with this, Cloud Foundry has all the runtimes pre-installed on each of the execution nodes. And then the application will only then need to shift with its own code and any third-party non-standard libraries that it's using. Okay, so that's kind of the basics of language in Cloud Foundry, but now we'll get to the bit people hopefully care about, which is how Erlang fits into it. So, we need to make a number of assumptions about Erlang, because as we know, Erlang doesn't necessarily have as many conventions as something like a Ruby or a Node app, in terms of when you build a web app. You can choose any number of different web frameworks, you can choose any number of different build tools, and all of these are started, stopped, etc., in completely different ways. So the way that the Cloud Foundry integration works is it makes a number of basic assumptions about it. So the first one is, is that we assume your application is an OTP app and it's being built with Rebar, or something that looks like when the output's done, like Rebar. Because of this, we get to make a number of assumptions. The first one being that it's gonna be an app directory generated that's got a bunch of files and a fairly standard layout. The first thing we'll expect is that within that app, there's a bin directory that's got a start script that can be used to start up your application. The start script isn't particularly standard, but we expect the rule that if you've got a .rel file, whatever that's named, then we'll find the start script for the same thing. It's obviously a bit of a restriction on the application, but I don't really think it's a big one because it's a fairly good, clean thing to do anyway. Next up, we, we expect to find a VM start configuration file in ETC. Again, this is something that Rebar does by default, which generated templates. And the reason that we rely on this is the number of modifications you need to make to a running Erlang VM in order to make it work nicely when someone else is launching it. So 
because the CD output and minus no input onto it means that instead of attempting to load a shell, which obviously doesn't do anything when no one's controlling it, helps. Being able to give it a plus B, which tells it that you don't actually need to do multiple control Cs to shut things down is also quite helpful. And also being able to give it a dynamic node name for dash name means that if you happen to put multiple instances of Erlang onto the same machine or your application gets worked in multiple places, we don't end up with any kind of naming clash. Finally, we can expect to find all your application code in lib. So this is actually one part where the Cloud Foundry deployment starts to deviate a little bit from standard Erlang practice. Because as I mentioned before, we're trying to keep the binary small and also Cloud Foundry pre-installs the runtimes onto those machines. So a, a application that's being pre-compiled with the RHEL tool as part of Rebar tends to include both the Erlang runtime, the standard libraries, and your code altogether. So what we actually do to work around this in the Cloud Foundry code base is instead of requiring you to change the way you build your application, when you actually upload it, we change all the common libraries to symlinks based on where it actually is on the deployed node, which has the advantage of then being the application binary is a lot smaller. And also it means if you happen to do your build on an OSX machine, for instance, which has a completely different architecture to a Linux deployment host, then you'll find that the application will continue to work. The only time that unfortunately falls apart is if you've got custom C code running inside your application. Okay, and the final bit about it is, as I mentioned before, we pass an environment variable to describe to your application how they should do the, the bits, the touch points they need to integrate with the platform. So when you start up and bind your HTTP server, we obviously can't control that because you, you could use any number of different frameworks. Also, your supervision hierarchy could be any number of different things. It's just not acceptable. So what we do is we'll give you an environment variable called VNC app port, which will tell you which port your application needs to bind on. And once you've done that, it's at that point that the Cloud Foundry runtime knows your application's alive and it will start routing requests to it. The other part, as I mentioned, about the services being provided to your application, these come through in the VCAF services environment variable, which is actually a JSON hash listing out all the different services you're being bound. So pretty much as long as you compile JSON, then your application is going to be accessing those services. It can, in there, there'll be the addresses, the usernames, passwords, types, all available to you, at which point you can use them just like they were configured in a static config file or hard code into your application even. So from here, we're going to move into something a little bit more interesting, which is Cloud Foundry in action, so we actually cool. Thanks. All right, so to wake you up a little bit, um, this, this part is hands-on. So if you have machines available, um, we actually have the slides on Cloud Foundry. So you can access them at this URL, studioscloudfoundry.com slash Erlang. Okay. And how many of you have a Cloud Foundry account? Anybody? So if you don't have an account, I'm gonna give you a promo code to get signed up right away so you can follow along. So here's the URL. You can just go to cloudfoundry.com, there'll be a big sign up button. And then if it asks you for a promo code, just type the word hack. So part of the beauty of working with Cloud Foundry is that it makes it very simple for developers to interact and scale the apps. And the way we interact with Cloud Foundry is using a command line interface called VMC. And VMC is distributed as a Ruby gem. And so if you want to interact with Cloud Foundry, one of the most common ways is using VMC, of course, it's a REST API, so we do have other libraries. So I would like you guys to install the VMC gem. And then if you use the promo code hack, you should have gotten a password and you can actually log in. And what I'm gonna show you now is, since we're using cloudfoundry.com, I'm first going to show you just deploying a very simple Sinatra application. Sinatra is a very 
lightweight uh, Ruby web framework. So I'm going to so meanwhile you guys get registered. Okay, so So has everyone got URLs? So it's studios.cloudfoundry.com slash airline. And then I just want to make sure that everybody can use VMC. So let me. So if you can use it, you should be able to also look up the reference via VMC help. And I have the very latest VMC. I installed it with the dash dash pre flag. And so it's given me not only the ability to push apps and scale them, um, one of the new things that we added is tunneling for services and also access to Micro Cloud Foundry. And Micro Cloud Foundry, I'll cover in a minute, it's a miniature version of cloudfoundry.com that we basically you can download it and run it a VMware image, okay? So this is the exercise that we're gonna try. So we're gonna, I'm just going to clone um, a very simple Sinatra app, sorry. And if you forked it, it would be your name. Do you guys use GitHub? Okay. Okay, so the next step is Packaging the jumps. So this will take a little bit. And it's the equivalent of make, I guess, in our line. Not exactly, but. Um, so we'll let that have fun with the Wi-Fi. Except sadly, a lot slower. Yeah, this is kind of slow right now. The 1.1 version is fun. There we go. Yay. Okay. So now I can do VMC push. So I'm going to push this app. Oh. So one thing that I need to change is I forgot to do this. Numbers, my. I've done this before, huh? <laughs> All right, so we're going to push it now. And on the first time push, it pushes the entire contents um, of the current directory, but on subsequent updates, it only pushes deltas. So I've pushed my application. I can now see it if I type VMC apps. So I have a few more, but here's the one I just typed. And I can look at the logs. OK, great. It looks like it's up. So to access it, so there's my app. So it's just very simple uh, Sinatra app. And then if I want to, make sure, 
I want to make changes. I have a YAML file which uses portable context. Uh, so I'm going to So I changed it, and now I'm going to do a VMC update. Okay. And let's see here. Um, I think I'm in an odd directory. One second. Doing some weird caching. Um, Delete it real quick. Make sure it's deleted. Okay. Okay. So now, if I want to look at environment variables. I can do VMC and V. I'm actually going to. I see what happened. Um, yeah, so sorry about that. I was in the wrong directory when I copied. Um, I'm going to re clone it one more time. Yeah, I was, um, so basically I made changes to the file and they didn't reflect and I was like, what's happening? But I was uh, still in another app. <laughs> All right, so now I'm in the right place. I'm going to do again the bundle and I'll delete the old app. Okay, and now I'm gonna do And then we'll let that run. In the meantime, though, um, were you guys able to get VMC set up? You didn't get the mail. Do you use the promo code hack? Okay. Hopefully, it will be coming soon. They told me it never expires. It's my own personal promo. So yeah. So basically, the push is interactive. This is what a typical push looks like. You get to pick your application name. You're bound with using CloudFoundry.com on the CloudFoundry.com service. But if you're running your own version of the source code, you can register URLs that are outside a given domain. So you can pick any domain name. And then, um, as we saw, you know, you get to say how many instances. And based on, you probably would set it up with like new relic monitoring. And based on certain thresholds and alerts, you would scale up or scale down. So if you want to see if you're pointing at different Call Foundry instances and you want to see what runtimes are offered, you can always do VMC runtimes. So now I'm going to, so we see that in callfoundry.com we have Ruby 1819, Node, Node 06, and Java. But then once I target um, the open source version, we can see 
that we have Erlang, Python, and PHP as well. Okay, so let me get back to pushing this one more time. Thanks for your patience. You guys saw me just now do specify the runtime. So if we had provided additional support for Erlang, we could specify different runtimes when pushing apps. Once you've pushed an app, you can't switch runtimes. You have to delete it and repush it. Um, okay. And then this is our, all the frameworks, the web frameworks. How many of you do development in other languages other than Erlang, anybody? Okay, great. Um, what are some of the languages and what frameworks that you guys use? Cool. How about you? Okay. Great. So we have um, Active State, which runs a Cloud Foundry instance, and they support Python and Perl. So now I'm going to edit this again just to prove that it works. Okay, so there it is. Sorry about that. Typing in the wrong directory. Okay, so moving on. Okay, so we covered pushing an app and updating an app. You can also, you guys saw me quickly delete, delete the app as I scrambled. And you can also start, restart and stop. And you guys saw me get the logs. In addition to that, you can also give it more memory and up the instances. So let's try that. We're gonna say VMC instances. And I'm gonna say, I don't know, five. <laughs> okay, I gave it too much memory. Let's say two, three. This account is really full. <laughs> Fun. That's okay, I can switch to a different account. So if you guys want to see when you're pretty much at your limit, so I guess I'm at 1.9 out of my two gigs. Um, so I'm just going to, I guess I'll delete some other stuff. Okay, that worked. Um, so once you up the instances, you can say VMC stats. And you see the health of both your instances. And once again, this is just a wrapper around the REST interface. If you wanna see the REST calls or write your own, you can do a dash T and that's going to output the JSON response. So tips for using VMC, um, you do want to get the very latest VMC. It has access to manifest and tunneling. And um, once again, to use dash T. Now, if you want to try Cloud Foundry running on your own machine, if you wanna poke around, um, one quick alternative to installing the open source code is to just download MicroCloud Foundry. So you guys can download MicroCloud Foundry from cloudfoundry.com slash micro. 
And what it's going to do is once you, you know, you log in with the account for Cloud Foundry that you received, and it's going to allow you to set up the DNS to point to your IP. So for example, I have taken over those two and I can regenerate a token, start Cloud Foundry, and it's going to route all traffic to my instance. Okay, so micro Cloud Foundry is something if you wanna check it out very quickly. And then once again, it uses the same REST API and you can use VMC with it. Um, the cool thing about micro Cloud Foundry is any, it's open registration. So you can re just register with a command line. You don't have to wait for the email. Okay, and we covered this sort of on the beginning slide and then um, Paul covered it briefly, but we do have some pre amazing services. Um, so MySQL, I'm sure many of you have used, is the world's most used RDBMS. Um, and we support version 5.1, if you wanna learn more. PostgreSQL, we support version 9.0. It's another very popular RDBMS. And then for those of you that are working with NoSQL, we support MongoDB version 1.8. And MongoDB, I, I love MongoDB. It has a, it has a great community. Um, it's evolving very rapidly. And we're currently working with a partner to offer Mongo to support. MongoDB2. Um, Redis, how many of you have tried Redis? Great. So Redis is awesome for caching um, and awesome for PubSub. So Redis is another thing that we support. Um, VMware actually sponsors the Redis project and it's also an open source project. And then finally, your favorite, I think, RabbitMQ, written in Erlang. And uh, the Rabbit team also works uh, in VMware, and Rabbit uses AMQP, and it's enterprise grade QN system. Okay, so with that, uh, let's jump to what you came here for, the demo of deploying an airline app. And so for this, what we did is So here I've targeted, if I type VMC target, I'm targeting my VM that is running um, the open source version of Cloud Foundry. So here's the VM. Um, and we just did the VMC runtimes. So Paul, do you wanna drive this or do you want me to drive it? Okay, you can. You can talk through it. So I want to see how, what apps do I have on here. And do you want to talk a little bit about Mochi or? Um, I'm sure everyone is familiar with Mochi Web. It's probably one of the older HTTP support libraries that you get in there. So this application is obviously aiming to be really simple. If we just go to a web browser quickly and show what it actually does. Uh. Yeah, so what we have here is the application is simply tells you what port has been provided and also the VCAP services, which I was talking about before, which is the list of all the services that have been bound. So as you can see there, it's, there's been a MongoDB service that's been attached to this. It's got kind of all the details you'd need if your application actually wants to start talking to it. So I guess one thing we could do is we could just add another service or a Redis instance of this. Yeah. So let's do VMC create service MongoDB Mongo airline. Okay, and then VMC bind service MongoDB to Mocky two. Sorry, I put the wrong service name, Mongo Airline. So when you bind a service, it does restart um, and then Oh, 
Oh, I see. So that was obviously a demonstration of the fact that you can you can reuse a service across multiple different applications. So if you had a message queue that wanted to be shared, the breakdown between a service and a binding means you can actually have one service created and bind it to multiple applications. Here you can see now that the application is actually being dynamically updated and purely on the basis that the hash is longer, you can actually see there's now a second service with the details in there. So it's at this point you can imagine that your operations team would want to change the location of the server or they want to add another one. If your application is smart enough to look in there, you might even be able to have it because you can dynamically add services and you can do something with them. But more likely it's going to be that the service gets added it may get relocated to a different location. That, at this point, is not your application's concern. You're just looking to that hash, and you're good from there. Mm -hmm. um, so let me show what we're working with, I guess. Um, OK. So I guess anyone that's seen what gets dumped out when you use the standard rebar templates should hopefully see this as being relatively familiar. So you've got your kind of standard make file. You've got the rebar generate script. The interesting stuff, I guess, is going to be in the source directory. And again, it's all pretty standard pretty standard stuff. So we've got an application with the main entry point. We've got a supervisor. And then we've got the standard mocking web main web files. Which we'll just go with that one now. So you can see here all the very standard mocky web noise. And then eventually you get to the point here where we're doing a, when you do a request, we're dumping out those two environment variables. We'll make a change to it. Oh, is it? Okay, and now you can see wrapping around, you've got the two environment variables, so the VM, the VCAP output and the VCAP services, which you can see in the output there. Um, the one other thing to open would be the main mocking web test on Perl app. So you can just see here, I'm wrapping around to the supervisor's name. Oops. Ah. This one? Oh, this is the one for the server. Yeah, and here we go. We can see that. As the supervisor boots up our web child, we just have the one line of code here that just looks up the environment variable. The, a nice pattern to do is given that you may want to run this locally on your own machine, instead of having to set the port all the time, just hard code in a default port that gets used. So if you boot it up normally, you get some kind of sensible default behavior. All right, so does it make a rel? Oh. Okay, so it's the standard build process as with the Ruby code. The idea here is that you, are, you will actually build the code here locally on your machine first. Cloud Foundry doesn't actually do any of the build for you on the other side, it's just responsible for the packaging. And you can see the rel directory then contains the mocking web test app. And it's this app here that we can act and as you can see it's the standard etc, bin, lib, etc. And the deploy process here is the exact same as for the Ruby application. We can see that the way that Cloud Foundry actually does all the detection, this is all done client side. So the, the command line utility actually has code in there that's capable of detecting all the different language runtimes. In this case, the way we detect Erlang is actually looking in the, in the, in the releases directory, we find a .app file, and that is actually the signal that we've got somewhere that looks like an Erlang application. So it's, it's just a whole bunch of heuristics that run. It looks for various possible signals that are actually running a certain, certain platform. It then tells 
file foundry that's got an early application, uploads all the code, and it's at that point it takes over and then it's out. Great. So that app deployed very well. And uh, that concludes our airline demo. Did you guys have any questions for us? Palo Alto? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is, um, well, it's actually distributed, uh, distributed. There's some people in Seattle and some people in New Hampshire, but yeah, mainly out of Palo Alto. Yes, we are. We are not ready to announce it yet, but um, BB is in talks with um, Bushido. Is it Bushido? Basho. Ah, uh, yes. I even got their sticker yesterday. Did they already throw their party? Yeah, so that would be done in conjunction with a monitoring service. So it's not done um, by default, but if you w use New Relic or another monitoring service, you can do it in conjunction with a programmatic API. So that was the VMC instances command. So kind of, I guess what I was alluding to is more that from your application's perspective, you'll get scaled up and down kind of at, at the op at operation team's whim or at some other automated tool's whim. It's not something your application specific has to code in. But if you want that auto scaling kind of thing to happen, then you'll need something else that kind of understands what your application straining looks like. It's in, yeah, it's pretty much immediate. You guys saw me do it, right? Just See if it has enough memory to six. So that. Yep. And yeah. I guess the other thing you can actually use to show this, if you now go back to the browser and just keep refreshing that page, each of those is going to have its own port. So you actually should see the Mocky 3 results be unstable. Uh, let's see. Can we give it enough load? So if we just, yeah. See, as, as we keep refreshing, you can see the ports changing. There. Oh, and also, yeah. So you can actually see there it's balancing across a bunch of different instances. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. um, there are some portions that use Rabbit, but it's mainly written in Ruby and Java. Any other questions? Nope. If not, I want to thank you guys for your time. Appreciate it. Uh, callfoundry.com is in beta right now, and we would love to hear feedback from you. And thanks, Paul, for your contribution and for helping run the session.